Hello, everyone. My name is Meredith Langlitz, and I am the AIS Director of Programs. Welcome to the final edition of Archaeology Abridged of this lecture season. For those of you joining for the first time, the Archaeological Institute of America is North America's oldest and the world's largest archaeological organization with over 200,000 supporting and subscribing members. From its founding in 1879, the AIA has been committed to supporting archaeology and archaeologists, publishing and disseminating the research the results of archaeological research, and providing programming like this one for a variety of audiences. If you aren't familiar with the AIA, we are a membership organization. Our programs are supported by our members. So thank you to all of our members today uh, out there. And if you are not a member, please join us. You can read all about the benefits of membership on our website at archaeological.org slash join. And by becoming a member, you can stay apprised of all our upcoming programs. I want to emphasize that beyond the support we receive from our members, the breadth of programming that the AIA provides is only possible because of our donors. We could not do pro public programs like this or back archaeologists to support future discoveries without our dedicated donors. If you can, we encourage you to join this group of contributors with a gift, large or small. Again, you can donate right on our website at archaeological.org slash donate. All right, please note, this is a live presentation. The AIA will be recording this presentation, but we ask that you do not. If you would like to see the recording from today's talk, we will post it on the AIA's YouTube channel within the next few days, and we'll send everyone that is registered a link when it's ready. If you joined us last week for Sarah's talk about her work at Grand Ronde, today's format will differ quite a bit. Archaeology Abridged, as the name hints at, is a shorter talk, so Sarah will give a 20 minute long presentation that will be followed by ample time for questions. We love to see your questions, and since there are a lot of you on here and the chat tends to get lively as well, we ask that you use Zoom's dedicated Q&A box to submit your questions for Sarah so that they don't get lost. All right, I am so excited to introduce you all today to Dr. Sarah Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is an associate professor at the University of Washington and a curator at the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture in Seattle. She works at the intersection of tribal historic preservation, indigenous studies, and public history. Her research specifically examines how community-based participatory approaches to research improves the empirical and interpretive quality of archaeological narratives while also situating archaeology within a more respectful and engaged practice. This involves exploring the diverse applications of minimally invasive field methods and digital media as tools for contributing to the capacity of tribal communities to manage their historic and environmental resources. Centered on her ongoing collaboration with tribal communities in California, Oregon and Washington, Dr. Gonzalez has developed multiple classroom, lab, and field school programs that provide undergraduate and graduate students with the opportunity to participate directly in research with tribal communities that contributes to their capacity to study, manage, and represent their heritage. She has co-authored numerous journal articles and in 2018 co-authored the book, The Archaeology of a Matini Village, an archaeological study of sustained colonialism. She is also an editor for the forthcoming publication, Rutledge Handbook of the Archaeology of Indigenous Colonial Interaction in the Americas. Uh, I'm so pleased that she's going to be able to present to us. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and have us get going. Uh, we're so glad you're here to, today with us, Dr. Gonzalez, and take it away. Oh, thank you so much for that warm introduction, Meredith, and for the invitation to share a little bit about a little bit more about the work that I do. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the shared lands and waters of the federally recognized Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot Nations, and unrecognized Duwamish tribe. I also want to give thanks to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and their Historic Preservation Office for granting me the privilege of living on and coming to know their lands and heritage these past nine years now. As a Chaconic scholar, I'm committed to creating space for Indigenous peoples through my service in and outside of the Academy. And this morning, I want to share how this commitment is realized through field methods in Indigenous archaeology. Archaeology, the community-based research and training program that I've co-directed with the Grand Ronde Historic Preservation Office since 2014. 
This project and my work more broadly examines the challenges and opportunities for creating indigenous archaeologies. These are approaches to studying, caring for, and representing the past that are conducted with, for, and by indigenous peoples. In the language of self-determination, indigenous archaeologies are expressions of sovereignty. The sovereignty to determine how tribal heritage will be cared for now and into the future. U.S. tribal nations encounter several challenges in articulating such sovereignty-based approaches to archaeology and historic preservation. These include a lack of funding and staffing, and most significant, the difficulty of operating within a legal framework that was not designed to include the specific needs or perspectives of tribes. So what do these challenges mean for a nation like Grand Ronde and its Historic Preservation Office? It means that a staff of seven is directly responsible for managing over 14,000 acres of reservation and trust lands, and they have oversight over the Confederated Tribes' ancestral territories across Western Oregon, which constitute approximately a quarter of the state's lands in which over 50% of the state's population currently resides. To put this in context, in the past year alone, the Historic Preservation Office, or HPO, has reviewed over 7,000 notices pertaining to federal undertakings. These are federal projects that have the potential to disturb Grand Ronde's cultural resources. Given this situation, how then can an, an indigenous nation like Grand Ronde make archeology span work for and in accordance with its own cultural protocols and values for engaging with tribal heritage? And how can we as archeologists and as a discipline begin to do archeology span in a good way? So doing archaeology, doing good V archaeologies, which are always designed with specific reference to the individual needs and heritage values of the community with whom they are developed. While field methods in indigenous archaeology or FMIA is but one example of a growing, rapidly growing field, there is value, I think, in understanding the broader lessons of what it means to create a grand ronde way for doing archaeology. And this morning, I'm going to begin by asking us to consider what happens when we understand archaeology as both a science and as a form of storytelling. I'll then turn to three lessons from FMIA's approach to archaeological storytelling to show what we stand to gain from the stories we tell to how we tell them to the methods we use on the ground when Indigenous perspectives are moved from the margins to the mainstream. So what exactly happens when we think of archaeology as a form of storytelling? Because typically when we mention this, people have very strong reactions. And this is often because people typically also think of archaeology as a science. Certainly, archaeologists use a set of defined procedures from controlled excavations to survey of regions using LIDAR to identify and study cultural sites. And we also apply a range of scientific techniques such as carbon-14 or thermoluminescence dating, the extraction and identification of fat and protein residues left behind on stone tools or cooking vessels, or even DNA testing of soils to determine what specific types of plant and animal communities lived at a specific place in time. And in combining these field and lab-based studies of ancient and contemporary sites, we begin to answer questions about the past, from how peoples across human history have responded to climactic shifts or environmental catastrophes, to understandings of technological and social innovations. Yet, even with these procedures and techniques, archaeology, like other science fields, is a form of storytelling. And when we think of our work as one of telling scientific stories, it begins to complicate our understanding of what it is we do when we do archaeology. Our investigations of the material histories of humans result in narratives, interpretations that define people through their history and heritage. The specific questions we ask are guided by individual and shared interests, as well as the expertise that we bring to our work. And the methods that we use on the ground or in the lab to recover evidence guides what types of interpretations or narratives may be told with that evidence. 
Furthermore, our findings are communicated to a wide variety of audiences, academic and public, and because archaeologists are situated with the authority to interpret what's referred to as the archaeological record, the stories that we carry, that we tell, can carry great import for the individuals or communities connected to them via time and place. And the valence of archaeological narratives is especially prominent in North America, where the majority of archaeological work involves the study and representation of indigenous histories and heritage, though the majority of archaeologists today are not indigenous, myself included. Here, the historically asymmetrical and colonial relations between the state and tribal nations are replicated within the legal and disciplinary frameworks that guide how we study and protect the past and who has the right to do so. For example, U.S. heritage laws charge archaeologists with legal stewardship over the archaeological record. And this authority is predicated on the systematic occupation and dispossession of indigenous peoples from their homelands. Put simply, that indigenous peoples no longer reside in place provides the premise for the state's continued claim over and to indigenous lands. The enactment of heritage laws in turn further cements the state's claims by vigorously denying and thus erasing indigenous sovereignty in the present, that is the rights of indigenous peoples to manage and care for their ancestral territories. Furthermore, the stories in ar that archaeology has traditionally told about indigenous peoples often align with what we might refer to as single stories. Single stories are the kinds of flattened monolithic stories that we tell about groups of people, especially those who are marginalized or oppressed, that reduce the complexity of a historical event or community to a singular experience. Now, popular media representations of Native peoples abound with such single stories. For example, sexualized renderings of Pocahontas and Native women, sports mascots that rely on the stereotypical image of the warlike brave, and depictions of the ecological Indian as popularized by an anti-littering campaign. Each of these tropes reinforces the idea of the timeless static Indian, always relegated to the past and fundamentally at odds with modernity and civilization. Anishinaabe scholar Gerald Visner refers to these stereotypes as terminal colonial narratives. Terminal because they presume the assimilation and eventual demise of Native peoples in the face of Euro-American colonization, and colonial because they are political tools that serve to erase Native peoples and their rights in the present moment. Within archaeology and anthropology, this myth of the vanishing Indian, prompted early 20th century salvage ethnography and archeological work designed to document native peoples before their supposed looming extinctions. And we see traces of this narrative and how we define archeology span in the Americas as either being prehistoric or historic, the former associated with the study of native heritage and the latter with Euro-American settlements and historical figures. This despite the fact that indigenous peoples continue to live and thrive today. The colonial foundations of this field and these practices have been roundly critiqued and largely rejected. But I highlight them here as reminders that archeology span is not a value-free field. In fact, when we frame archaeology as a form of storytelling, it invites close thinking not only about the images and histories that we convey, but also about the methods we use to research and represent Indigenous histories and heritage. For it's in the methods of storytelling, who is telling the stories, in what ways, and for whom, that we begin to dismantle or unsettle the single stories and terminal narratives of Indigenous history. As an archaeologist who works in community-based partnership with tribal nations, my research and service in the field answers the questions of how might we use archaeology as a tool to resist these single stories, and what methods of storytelling might help us along the way. I want to shift now to discuss how indigenizing archaeology with the Grand Ronde Historic Preservation Office answers these questions by creating a Grand Ronde way for doing archaeology in a good way. And here I offer three lessons for what it means to do good according to the terms set by the Grand Ronde Nation. Lesson number one, moving from creating knowledge about 
to creating knowledge with. Now, historically, anthropology and archaeology have created knowledge about indigenous peoples. Knowledge about refers to an extractive relationship in which the researcher observes from a privileged vantage point, generating knowledge independent of a community with no responsibility or accountability to them. In contrast, producing knowledge with is distinguished by the formation of personal reciprocal relationships between a researcher and community in which all partners and their knowledge contributions are valued. The principal way that field methods in Indigenous archaeology creates knowledge with Grand Ronde is through our community-based research protocol. A community-based research is framed as a democratic process in which community partners share decision-making authority over the design and implementation of research. It's through the shared authority that research partners define a process that's grounded in their shared needs, knowledge values, and methodologies. And here, I just want to um, kind of point us to the community-based research protocol that FMI has developed. I'm happy to return to this in the Q&A. Um, what I want to say here, though, is that what's transformative in Indigenous and community-based archaeologies like this project is that Indigenous ways of knowing and bodies of experience frame the research process and thus directly inform how we recognize evidence as such and how we select the appropriate methods for gathering, working with, and interpreting, and also sharing that evidence. For example, in my work with Grand Ronde, engaging with Econom. These are Grand Ronde's histories that are communicated in place and through people's practices. This encourages us to think about the relationality of Grand Ronde's communities to their homelands from time immemorial to the present. Knowledge of these relations between people, places, and practices, this is a phrase that's oft repeated by the HPO staff and which I'm going to return to in a few minutes. These, this Working with Econom frames how FMIA works with Grand Ronde's heritage. It's from this starting point that we begin to integrate other knowledge resources from the historical record to data recovered via archeological or environmental science methods. And we do this in order to create holistic understandings of Grand Ronde's history and heritage. Now, these engagements approach Grand Ronde's knowledge on its own terms, rather than seeing that knowledge as a data set that we can mine to interpret archaeological sites. Lesson number two, building our collective capacity. In reorienting research as a tribally led and co-investigatory process, FMIA re-envisions archaeology as an opportunity to do good, that is to build the capacity of community partners in ways that are meaningful to the community. In the context of our work together, field methods in Indigenous archaeology builds capacity in several ways, including first working with the Historic Preservation Office to develop a low-impact archaeological methodology that they and other partners can employ in caring for and protecting tribal heritage both on and off reservation. Second, in undertaking archival and archaeological research that it enhances that office's ability to facilitate the remembering and sharing of tribal histories of survivance, how they have not simply survived, but thrived in the face of settler colonial displacement and violence. And finally, training the future generation of tribal heritage managers so that there will always be a tribal members with relevant training and capacity to carry out historic preservation duties. While these projects directly address the capacity related needs of Grand Ronde, it would be a misnomer for us to approach capacity building from a deficit model. All too often, Indigenous communities are imagined as a need of repair or assistance that only us outsiders can provide. Let me be clear, this is a single story, and it precludes awareness of the deficits that we might bring to the table, and what deficits we have as a field that's synonymous with colonialism and imperialism. Craig Chippewa and James Quinn refer to this as, quote, the collaborative wolf in sheep's clothing intending to do good while unwittingly replicating the same sets of colonial relations we are intending to unsettle or dismantle. Now, FMIA emphasizes that capacity building is a two-way street. Our three interrelated projects are equally as much about serving the tribal community as they are about building the capacity of archaeologists and archaeologists in training to care for and protect 
Grand Ronde heritage. Despite consultation with tribal nations being a core element of modern archaeology as it's practiced in the US and Canada today, there remain but a handful of programs like FMIA that provide hands-on training in working with and for tribes. To date, we've trained over 40 undergraduate and graduate students, almost 40% of whom come from communities historically excluded from archaeology and the academy. In discussing with our students why they applied for and accepted admission into FMIA, students have specifically indicated that the field school made them feel like they could do archaeology in a different way, one that they didn't imagine was possible based on their prior archaeology experiences. They've also noted how it felt to not be the only one, and this is an experience I'm deeply familiar with here. I argue that in creating knowledge with all of our research partners, including our students, we've changed how we do archaeology so that it's more inclusive of a wider body of archaeologists. The continued participation of our undergraduate and graduate students in the program and beyond suggests how we might achieve these goals, not just in Indigenous archaeology field schools, but across the discipline. Lesson three. It's about the people, places, and practices. This might be the biggest lesson for ourselves and others, so much so that it's become FMIA and the HBO's kind of unofficial motto. What archaeologists refer to as the archaeological record, so sites, artifacts, landmarks, are for many indigenous communities manifestations of sacred, powerful relationships between histories, ancestors, cultural landscapes, and cultural practices that remain relevant to contemporary daily life. To reflect these longstanding and enduring relations, the Historic Preservation Office and our project look, uses terms like belongings instead of artifacts to assert the responsibility involved in and continued ownership over tangible heritage. And they routinely integrate econom, those tribal histories from time immemorial to the present, into the interpretation of their ancestral territories. And there's an example of this that Sarah's going to put into the chat of a story map that Grand Ron produced. Um, it's associated with the story of South Wind and the formation of Tillamook Bay. I really encourage folks to check it out. It's really wonderful and beautiful and shows what the tribe is trying to do in integrating econom into back onto the land. Now, together, these vocabulary shifts are designed to center Grand Ronde knowledge and specifically the interconnected web of human and non-human relationships that created and which continue to sustain the tribal community. Now, integrating community concerns and perspectives also transforms how we do archaeology on the ground, and it does so in ways that I think improves our, that is science's, ability to care for the past in meaningful ways. Using archaeology as a tool to manage Grand Ronde heritage raises significant concerns in community as phys physical disturbance of ancestral sites and belongings has the potential to endanger the health and well-being of community. But the use of low impact methods and methodologies, as you see here described on the slide, and such as we employ with the Historic Preservation Office, presents a way for us to carefully consider and conserve Grand Ronde's tribal cultural resources in ways that work in accordance with their cultural protocols and heritage values. Certainly, in the case of FMIA and other community based research projects I'm affiliated with, Low impact methodologies present an alternative way of doing good archaeology, one that allows us to minimize potential for harm by minimizing the physical and spiritual impacts of archaeological practice. In my experience, collaborative thinking with tribal heritage managers also results in creative and rigorous assessments of archaeological methods and methodology. Specifically, these collaborations inspired the development of the surface of the catch and release surface collection strategy, a form of intensive site survey and surface collection that provides for in field curation of belongings back into their original provenience after lab analysis and digital documentation. I'm happy to return to this method and chat more about it during our Q&A session. But here, what I want to talk about is that the real value of catch and release and FMIA's low impact methodology is that it calls on heritage managers to rethink what it means to work with and care for tribal heritage. 
in coming to see Grand Ronde's ancestral places as inextric inextricably connected to people today, we are placed in relation to these, to these peoples, to their belongings, and to their practices. This results in a fundamental shift in how we see and interact with tribal heritage as archaeologists. They go from being resources that we extract or objectively study to non-human relations that are owed our respect and remain living parts of community and practice today. So I want to conclude with a brief reflection on science and archaeology's increasing accountability with and to Indigenous nations. Knowledge collaboration is often framed in instrumentalist terms. Popular articles about, for example, the use of traditional ecological knowledge to reduce fire risk in the Western U US or to create more sustainable management of public lands. These often frame collaborative partnerships as the key obstacle standing in the way of scientific progress. Collaboration change our work beyond just getting access to indigenous knowledge and data. Is the goal of collaboration to accomplish the predetermined project? Or do we want to learn about the past and present in, in new and possibly uncomfortable ways? In other words, for whose sake do we do this work? From the experience of FMIA's partners, the answers align with seeing collaboration itself as a powerful tool, one that has serious interpretive benefits. Our reading of sites and heritage are more robust when they are grounded in multiple lines of evidence. Similarly, making archaeology more accountable with and to Indigenous nations like Grand Ronde challenges us to reimagine what is possible through archaeology, and it encourages a wider understanding of what it means to do archaeology in a good way. What might we achieve in witnessing the past via the small traces people have left behind and in conversation with the living? And how, much, how might such dialogue engaged practice and emplacement of people, places, and practices move us towards greater equity and justice in archaeology and beyond. The process of building relationships alters who we are as archaeologists and as people, and we cannot return to a point in which we did not possess the insights that flow from these relationships. As Thomas King explains, don't say in the years to come that you would have lived your life differently if, it, if you had only heard this story. You've heard it now. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, you've given us so much to think about, uh, you know, last week and this week. And I know my brain's been buzzing with thoughts of, you know, adapting archaeological methodologies to better serve stakeholders, the importance of language, and as well as rethinking what stories we tell and why we're telling them. Uh, so let's get right into questions. Um, as a reminder to everyone in the audience, um, if you would like to ask a question, please use the separate Q&A box, not the chat box, um, so that it doesn't get lost. Um, so yeah, just jumping right in. Um, so I know you mentioned that in the past year, the Grand Ronde Historic Preservation Office has reviewed over 7,000 notices pertaining to federal undertakings. Um, I'm assuming some of those have led to some archaeology being done. Um, have you seen any contract archaeology in the state integrating Grand Ronde cultural protocols or FMIA community-based participatory research principles in practice as a result of your work? Oh, yeah. So just to put in context, that's just federal undertakings. That's just federally funded projects. That's I noticed not you said federal, so yes. <laughs> you know, on top of that, there's state and local. In fact, the Grand Ronde Historic Preservation Office does a lot to build what it calls meaningful consultation. Now, meaningful consultation goes beyond the bounds of kind of federally mandated government to government consultation. Um, and it builds personal reciprocal relationships with heritage managers working within the tribe's ancestral territories so that heritage managers can, be, can come to approach and see Grand Ronde heritage from the perspective of the tribe itself. 
they've done a lot of work of creating these relationships. And actually that photo that I showed of Jay Unger holding up the first salmon that the tribe was legally allowed to take from Willamette Falls, which is owned by the Army Corps of Engineers, that moment represents you know, decades of work and building meaningful consultations and relationships with heritage managers within Grand Ronde's ancestral territories. You know, So sometimes you don't, the tribe is working all across the board to try to explain what tribal sovereignty is, the fact that they are sovereign nations that engage in government to government consultation. This isn't just checking in with like your local neighbors or community organization. These are nations within the state that have specific sets of rights. Um, in terms of other examples where this has impacted, I think this is something that the Historic Preservation Office that they would want to chat more about, but that story of South Wind that I pointed you to, they've been working on a really long-term project at Tillamook Bay talking about, um, you know, what the changing sea levels mean for the protection of cultural resources along the coast there, and that project of the story of South Wind was really used as well as an opportunity to think about not just those rising sea levels, but thinking about the formation of that landscape within the tribe's histories. So that's another really great and public example of some of the work that they've been doing. Okay, um, and I guess, I, I mean, I, it sounds like the, the Historic Preservation Office is, you know, doing a lot of this and leading a lot of this. Is, it, is there any sense that it's resonating and, you know, like, you know, you know, people come back to them and they're already starting to think about this or are they starting fresh with every single uh, notice that they receive? <laughs> No, I don't think they're starting fresh at this point because they've put so much work into building those relationships with people with it working within their ancestral territories. I mean, we also kind of joked the training program isn't just about training students, it's about training seasoned archaeologists as well. So a big element of the field school is that we invite out the tribe's heritage partners in order to observe our practice in the field and learn more about our applications of the methodology and specifically catch and release surface collection strategy. So, you you know, part of this is just educating people about how we use it, how we use this carefully, and how it improves our ability to um, conserve and protect and care for Grand Ronde's cultural resources. We also discuss with them how they might adapt some of these methods to the various, you know, contexts in which they're working. You know, some of these methods don't work in every single place because of local site context. You know, we use a lot of GPR, ground penetrating radar, in our surveys as a way to kind of peek under the ground surface to get a sense for what might be underneath that surface so that we can then have a broader understanding and more targeted understanding of where certain features like privies or outhouses or wells or house floors might be located. So, it, you know, and that's a technique that, you know, so many tribal um, historic preservation offices and tribal archaeology programs have integrated a range of geophysical survey techniques from ground penetrating radar to resistivity and conductivity surveys for obvious reasons, because it provides us another tool. Um, but we found that a lot of cultural resource managers are really hesitant to integrate this, both because of the initial cost, but also because of fears that we'll use that and then um, won't follow up with additional ground, what's called ground truthing, that is understanding exactly what's under there. So like using that geophysical survey information um, to then highlight areas for more testing, rather than just using that ge geophysical survey in lieu of doing any more testing. So I think there's some fears around that. We're working on that. Actually, the Historic Preservation Office routinely brings its ground penetrating radar to local CRM projects and loans it out to other tri local tribes and do, does these surveys as a way to, you know, enhance capacity where they can. Okay. Well, I've got a, a, several questions that kind of build, build, build off of this theme. So uh, I've got one person writing in, uh, your collaborative approach in creating knowledge with prem premise seems very sensible and respectful. Has the National mm -hmm. Park Service, the Department of the Interior, or other federal land preservation agencies adopted any of the Grand Run methodologies? You know, I think it's been more on a case-by-case -case basis of various cultural resource management firms integrating these and or different heritage managers located within the nation using them. We haven't seen uptick at like the larger umbrella um, area. And in fact, in archaeology, there was recently a report that was issued by the Society for American Archaeology 
and ACRA, and I'm going to forget the, what it's like the American Cultural Resources something association. I might be totally wrong there. Sarah, if you could put that into the chat I think, for me. I think in American Cultural Resources, is, <laughs> you're, you're it's close. It's not perfect. <laughs> it's absolutely alphabet soup. But they recently re did a review of what they call no collection practices, because things like catch and release have been catching on with vari in various parts of the country. Um, but that report kind of presents no collection practices as being antithetical to a preservation ethic. So I think there's a little bit of a dis disconnection here between what some of the higher level managers think and what's happening on the ground. I also want to be careful to point out that the no collection practices practice that we use at Grand Ronde, catch, the catch and release surface collection strategy, um, we do full analysis of all of the surface collected belongings that we recover from ancestral sites that we're working at. So we bring those belongings back to the lab. We run a range of different kinds of tests, make sure that they're fully cataloged, make sure that we can get as much information about them as possible before their eventual replacement in their original collection provenience units. And indeed, kind of the analysis that we're doing goes above and beyond what often happens with kind of surface collected finds. They're considered really important for these early stages of field work to get a sense for how big a site is, how old it is, how many different types of occupation or peoples might have been present there, but then we rarely actually return to this. So really, a Grand Ron Historic Preservation and I see this as a method that has broader applicability and actually does a better job of both recovering information from those belongings and ensuring that they're protected back in their original places in which they became part of an ancestral place. I think right. there's, yeah. Yeah, we'll All right. people are running with this theme. So, so yeah. okay, so we, we, <laughs> we've, got, we've got a scenario for you, right? So okay. if you had the ear of all of the state historic preservation officers in the country and you could advise them, uh, what would you <laughs> highlight in particular based on what you've learned through this process? Well, first off, talk, to all of the tribal heritage managers in your region. This includes both official tribal historic preservation officers, as well as cultural resource departments that are, that are operated by tribes. There's a number of TIPOs, what we call TIPOs, and other more unofficial, but still representative of, of tribal governance, um, um, tribal heritage managers that are working there. If you do not have those relationships, I highly encourage that you have them and open lines of communication. We see that that makes a fundamental difference in how projects within people's ancestral territories get greenlit, what kinds of mitigation plans are developed, et cetera, et cetera. Meredith, what was the second part of your question there too? So, so if you add that ear, what would you highlight in particular um, on what you've learned through the process? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that creating personal lines of communication with people and learning directly from a tribe what their perspectives and heritage values are. There is a wide range of perspectives and differences between and across tribes. Nobody is the same. And indeed, this is why I use that plural form of indigenous archaeologies, because every single indigenous archaeology is developed in specific reference to the unique heritage values and cultural protocols of the nation that it's developed with. That's a really important point. Oftentimes we can kind of like paint a broad brush here and create a single story that I, either all tribes totally oppose archeology span or you know, we might even go with the opposite of like, well, this tribe you know, is totally on board with doing all of the, these destructive testing. And you know, clearly we just have to educate these other tribal heritage managers about why they should be okay with that. That is not the case. You have to ask people, you have to understand what each nation's approaches before proceeding. So those would be the two important lessons. And then I would probably want to take them out into the field to show them what our methodology looks like in practice and to show <laughs> them how we are conserving resources in the field. Sounds like a good workshop. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm glad you brought up the point about the indigenous indigenous archaeologies because I when I was looking at the notes for today, I had like circled and underlined that. So that that's I'm really glad that you got to highlight that here. Um, all right, so I have Peter Henry in the audience writing in, and he's asking, have any of the of the discoveries caused new interpretations of the past that have been at odds with the sort of the verbal or the ancestral history of the tribes? And if so, how has that been handled? 
You know, in all of the work that I've done, so prior to working with Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, I've worked with Ama Motsun Band of Ohlone, with Kent Lightfoot at UC Berkeley, and also with the Kashaya Band of Puma Indians at Fort Ross State Historic Park. And in all of that time, I have never actually encountered, we have a huge, where we have a huge disjuncture between what the material evidence is saying versus what the tribal histories are saying. And in fact, what usually happens is that that combination of the tribal histories, of the archeological kind of material-based evidence, of archival documents, they all tell kind of overlapping stories or they tell different aspects of the same type of story. So I've seen that as being more like as being something that's more that you deal with on more like kind of on a common basis. For example, at Brand Ronde, and I'll use the example of my former graduate student, now Dr. Ian Kretzler's work at the Uxiat Powell Grounds, which was also one of the sites of the early, one of the encampments of Malala speaking individuals who were, who were removed to the reservation over the winter of 1856 to 1857. Um, and in that case, we started finding a lot of peach pits. You know, in the archaeology, we're like, where is there's no peaches there today? And yet, all the other evidence that we have from doing kind of ethnobotanical surveys of that property is that the area is what we might refer to as a food forest. That is, there are a number of plants that are incredibly important to Grand Ronde peoples and that form still parts of their foodways today. So there's Saskatoon berries, there's Himalayan blackberries everywhere, obviously introduced, but still delicious and used. There's a lot of different kinds of plant medicines, like like St. John's wort, there's crab apples, there's pears, there's oak trees that we believe are between 100 to 150 years old. So this whole area was like going outside of your door, literally, and you have an entire garden, even though, you know, to outside to normalize, it just appears that it's like a natural kind of thing. This work on food gardens, I also want to give a shout out to Chelsea um, Armstrong's work at Simon Fraser University. She's partnered with a number of First Nations communities in British Columbia and documenting how people tended their landscapes right outside of their houses. And so, you know, in the, in the case of doing the excavations at the Malala encampment and finding all of these peach pits and piecing it together with all of the other plants that we see growing around, and we've also been doing um, work to test soil um, for presence and uh, for presence of other kinds of food remains. So like charred nuts and seeds and whatnot. All of this is enhancing our understanding of the variety of foods that Grand Ron, you know, continued to maintain their connection with and or integrated within their food ways. So that's what I mean when it enhances everything. It's usually not this just juncture. Um, examples of like disjunctures, I would say locally here in Washington state, we had um, work, it was in cultural resource management work at the Bear Creek site over in Mary Moore Park that has radically altered our understanding, for example, of the antiquity of indigenous peoples in this place. This shouldn't be a surprise to us. It's, you know, it's very difficult to find very ancient sites, but in this case, you know, the site is at least 14,000 years old. There's also Cooper's Ferry, it's connected to Nimipu, Nesbitt purse tribe and you know it's coming back with very old dates that is certainly supporting tribal narratives which indicate that their ancestors have lived there since time immemorial so and that's one case where there is a really big disjuncture where tribal histories have been the correct things and the archaeology for a long time hasn't been support in support of those but that's rapidly changing okay well to go in a little bit of a different direction for a minute uh, for a minute um uh, I know the importance, you know, you've underscored the importance of language and you introduced the concept of econom and also using the term belongings in lieu of artifacts. Are there other examples of adaptations in language that you've made in response to your work with the community? You know, those are the two big ones in terms of language. I think we try every summer that we are out at field school to learn more language. And me as a professor stuck here at UW campus, I have a little less opportunity to do language immersion and integrate language more into our daily practice. But several of our graduate students, um, so Eve Dewan, who worked with us from Brown University, now Dr. Eve Dewan, um, had, has been enrolled in language Chinook Wawa classes for several years now. And my current graduate student here at UW, Yoli Ngandali, is also doing language classes. I imagine this is kind of like the next element of the work that we're doing. Right now, though, we're following the lead from the Grand Ronde Historic Preservation Office about how to integrate such language when it's appropriate and when it's appropriate, we integrate 
integrate it. Um, and then we have another question um, on this on storytelling. So this is you know perfect for today's theme. But how is the storytelling affected by the fact that many Native nations are grouped together today in a way uh, and developing more multi-layer, complex perspective of archaeology be belongings and findings? Um, and she's saying, uh, Suzanne Kaufman saying that that means I suspect it would be more plural stories versus a story within the cultural resource findings within the groups. And I, yeah, I guess how how is how does that affect the storytelling? Well, I mean, it's a huge issue because as the name implies, the Confederate Tribes of Grand Ronde are a confederation of nations that has that were removed and resettled onto the reservation. So you have incredible diversity in terms of people's languages, in terms of where they're coming from, what kinds of relationships they had, what histories they bring with them. Um, and one of, in terms of storytelling, one of the biggest things that we've really thought about deeply via our community-based research protocol is how can we be as participatory as possible with our process of storytelling? Now, obviously, trying to involve all of the nation's members, that's not a feasible thing, but there's several ways that we have attempted to do outreach and invite in community partners to share their stories and or guide the work that we're doing. So for context here, the Historic Preservation Office um, also passes all of their work through the what's called the culture department or the culture um, the culture committee. And on the culture committee are a variety of elders and family representatives from across the nation who provide regular input and feedback to the Historic Preservation Office. In addition to that, any of the projects and work that we do via FMIA, that's also brought to tribal council for formal review and evaluation. In addition to that, um, the tribe and the Historic Preservation Office has hosted a number of kind of public venues for people to comment on and to become involved in the project. Every October, I'm so excited for this October because it's going to be back again, the Grand Ronde Culture and History Summit. If you're here in the Pacific Northwest or if you're close to Portland or even Seattle, it's not that far of a drive. Um, going and attending is one of the, it's like the highlight of the year. Why is it a highlight? Because the tribe brings in all of its research partners across the culture department, across the education department, across the natural resources department to learn about the work that the tribe is doing within its homelands. It's really cool. In that case, it's an opportunity for us to share out our work with the rest of tribal community, to share you know, what's happening um, with them, to get feedback, to also share with those other partners about what it looks like to do archaeology in a grand round way. Um, the results of a lot of these things have been broad interest within the field training program. You know, People routinely stop in on us at the Uxiat powwow grounds. That's where we camp during the summers. Um, and have meals with us or chat. You know, we attend community events. Again, it's kind of putting in FaceTime. We um, are there quite often. And the results of that is that there's pretty, fairly broad approval for the work that we are doing within community. Um, and elders, you know, who at first, you know, really didn't have an interest in working with archaeology, as we've demonstrated what it looks like to do archaeology in this way, have begun to work with the Historic Preservation Office and with the project to share a little bit more about that with us. So it's definitely something you have to understand. You know, I'm an archaeologist by training, but I'm also an anthropologist. And like the first recommendation of this is you have to do some ethnography. You have to understand how power works within a community, whatever community you're working within. You know, having a single story that everybody is the same just because they're a grand ron that's not the case so you have to understand then what are the different elements of community how do they work together what are the different ways that we can ensure that their voices are integrated in the process that we're using uh, yeah that, that's great so um i know you said that event is coming up in october i've got the ai team looking to see if there's a link they can find to share i don't think there's a link, link to it i don't think there's a link to it yet but it's usually right around halloween ish Okay, so late October. Okay, um, so if people are looking looking for that, it's, it'll be late October. Um, and if we find any links, we'll share them. Um, what is your advice for archaeologists beginning their careers, specifically those who want to participate in collaborative archaeological projects? Well, congratulations that you think that this is an important thing to integrate within your work. Um, the second thing that I usually tell students who are really interested is I kind of, I have a very frank conversation that doing the kind of work that I'm doing takes a lot of time. 
and it doesn't guarantee that it's going to turn out great. And you know, all archaeology projects, like you've got to stay flexible and fluid. This is what my old advisor at Berkeley always told me, Kent Lightfoot. You got to roll with the punches. You got to stay flexible and fluid. You have no idea what's going to happen. But when you're doing community-based collaborative work, um, it requires a lot of flexibility, and it also requires time. You know, I did the same the same kind of research as a graduate student, and the way that I was able to get into that was because my advisor, Kent, already had been working with the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians at that point for about 20 years. So there was a really robust relationship that had been created. There was a lot of trust and mutual respect. And so the project that I did and worked on, the Kashaya Pomo Interpretive Trail Project, you know, that was facilitated by the history of relations that Kent had cultivated with into, you know, the tribal nation itself, as well as with individual um, elders and tribal historians within the community. So I think, you know, if you're looking at really wanting to do this kind of work, thinking about what kinds of, you know, learning from somebody who has a project that's already ongoing, or that's willing to train you in these kinds of methods and these approaches to bring you in. Um, I think that can often be a very important thing. That's not to say you can't build this from scratch, but you've got to prepare, be prepared that it might take you a little bit longer because, you know, things happen, things have to change and shift, um, and things work at a different pace. Yeah. So longevity yeah. could be key if you're on a, on a timeline, uh, for sure. It's also similar to, you know, when you're working on it, you know, if you want to work internationally or you don't want to work locally and you don't necessarily have an advisor who works in the same settings that you do, you know, you still have to go in and build those relations. It's just at a different scale within community-based and collaborative research. I should also highlight that there's a fantastic new book that Sonia Adele just um, edited with several graduate students. I can't remember everybody's names on the volume, but I think it's called the Community-Based Archaeology PhD. And it offers a range of perspectives from graduate students and newly finished individuals about what it looks like to do community-based research as part of your graduate work. Really excellent re resource. I would highly recommend folks checking it out from their libraries. All right, I'm torn because there are a lot of questions about catch and release, but I think that we uh, we kind of we talked about them a lot, and it's on the Q and A from the recording from last week. Um, and then we also have this great uh, one another great question. Um, I guess can we do one short catch and release uh, uh, question, and then and then and then leave we leave with a uh... <laughs> All right. So if you can do the like simplest explanation possible of catch and release, um. And then we're, there's a specific question um, as part of catch and release belongings, is 3D printing ever used um, after lab analysis um, and uh, or, you know, would 3D printing be, you know, invasive and less agreed upon, you know, by the tribes? Well, Gwyneth, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. That question about whether or not it would be invasive and less permitted by the tribe, that's exactly, you're exactly like right on target with that one. Um, in the case of the projects that I've done with Grand Ron and prior with Kashaya and Amamutsun, we did not 3D print with Kashaya and Amamutsun. Um, and that's because the technology wasn't at the stage that really makes it available to 3D, you know, document hundreds if not thousands of surface collected belongings. We did, however, take normal photographs. With Grand Ronde, we are starting to process of doing 3D, um, of doing 3D photogrammetry on these belongings as a way, as another layer of, you know, knowledge that's kept and that will be curated by the tribal community. In that case, not everything will be 3D scanned um, and or we'll do, you know, photogrammetry with it, but it will be selected based on the, based on the guidance from the Historic Preservation Office. So that's, it's a cool new technology, highly recommend it. If the community that you're working with thinks that it's appropriate to do that, there is cases I know of that people refuse to do that because it's indigenous knowledge. How is it going to be curated? Who has access to it? Can it be monetized by people who get access to the data that's associated with it? So there's lots of concerns there. If you want me to talk about catch and release in brief, do we still want to do that? I think I, I don't want to, I don't want to discourage yeah. folks putting the catch and release questions in, but maybe I can just highly encourage them um, to check out the video from last week because the most of the Q and A uh, session last week was focused on catch and release. Um, because I do want to put put some time to this question that Melissa Franks posed, which is what 
And it's kind of a, it's a big one. So what changes need to be made in the field of archaeology for the practice to be more respectful and less, I'm assuming it's going to be destructive. Um. Well, this is a really good one because I've been making the argument for a long time that doing indigenous archaeologies, it results in a better archaeology, a more careful archaeology that has specific attention to how hierarchy gets played out within the field. To me, a lot of the things that we're talking about within archaeology. So, you know, there's been field surveys of, you know, astronomical rates of students and other and you know trained archaeologists experiencing sexual harassment and assault within a field, or bullying, or other forms of harassment and abuse. Um, those kinds of things to me relate from this deeply hierarchical model that we have for doing archaeology. I mean, it's even in the language that we use, which is really militaristic as well. You know, we have like crew chiefs. We don't use that term in our in our project because of the issues of language. Um, you know, you have like the field director who's usually in like full authority over everybody else. And in those kinds of contexts, like sending out a student to a field school, I always tell students to understand how what like the project relations look like and whether or not they're going to be able to participate in any of the decision making practices that typically have been reserved for the field directors and or the team leaders within a project. Um, for me, in thinking about like that, you know, when I talked a little bit about that and coming to create knowledge with Grand Ronde, we're trying to create knowledge with all of our partners. And so it's not just a tribally led and co-investigatory process with the HPO. It's also the case with all of our students. We really invest time in ensuring that they understand that they have a stake within this project, that they are let into the process by which we make decisions that they are co-owners of the work that we are producing. I think that's something that we could do a lot more work on in archeology. span How do we break down and dismantle those hierarchies that guide our relations? In many cases, those relations are really toxic because of how power works within our own field and within our field practice. So I think those are, you know, those are places where we can start on. If you're running a field project, if you're chairing a department, even if you're teaching in a classroom or even how you work with like your field crew within a CRM firm, really having careful consideration about how power works, I think is a starting point for us to start to change the relations of our fields so that they're more respectful that and that they acknowledge each of us as humans that deserve respect. Oh, well, thank you, Sarah. I think that that's gonna that we're gonna have to end on that one. But thank you so much. This has been fantastic. So much to think about um, for all of you here. Um, again, if you'd like to watch this video, we'll have it on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, if you missed Sarah's AI archaeology talk talk early, uh, last week, um, especially all of you out there asking catch and release questions, I. Highly recommend you go check it out on our YouTube channel. It's already there. Um, and um, yeah, I want to encourage all of you to stay and connect connected with the AIA, become a member, support our programs. We'll keep you informed. Um, Dr. Gonzalez's talk this month, uh, or both of her talks this month, are part of a larger lecture series. Um, and this was our last virtual lecture for the season, but We've already started planning for next year, um, so be sure to stay tuned for the lineup to come out later in the summer. Um, and yeah, Sarah, it's been such a pleasure. Um, so thank you so much uh, and goodbye for now. And thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah, thanks everybody for your wonderful questions and feel free to reach out either by email or catch me on Twitter at uh, Potato Kitty. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.